Hello and welcome to today's talk about Confucianism. And today we are going to particularly focus on how Confucianism informs the Chinese political discourse with a particular emphasis on how it has impacted Chinese foreign policy in the 20th century and to a certain extent the present day. Uh, in the center, we can see Confucius, who was the founder of Confucianism, and on the right we see Mencius, who came shortly after Confucius. He is not quite as well known in the West, but he is certainly a very important figure to understand Confucianism. Uh, in fact, he might even be equally as important as Confucius himself. So why is Confucianism important? And why is this whole idea of understanding the discourse important? Well, in order for us to properly understand how Chinese policymakers got from A to B, we need to understand the context in which they had those discussions. What were the ideas that were being brought up in the room as Chinese policymakers kind of hammered out how they were going to react, what kind of policies they were going to implement? And Confucianism has lended its name to the Confucius Institute, for example, which is the flagship soft power foreign policy program of China in the present day. Uh, it is responsible for Mandarin education around the world. There is actually a Confucius Institute at our university, Carleton. And uh, Confucianism is just so foundational for understanding East Asian societies uh, in general. It has been the official government ideology since the beginning of the Han Dynasty in 156 BC, which also happened to be the longest lasting of all of China's dynasties. Many Chinese would actually say it's because of the fact that they operated based on Confucian principles that they lasted such a long time. And we can best understand Confucianism as the main complement to realist thought in an IR context. So in understanding specifically China's diplomacy, um, realism is certainly an extremely important um, you know, framework for understanding the world. But unlike in the West, the main kind of complement to realism is Confucianism and not say, for example, liberalism. So to begin, this word is the um, a traditional character for to listen. This word means to listen, and its pronunciation is ting. And this word kind of um, embodies the whole nature of Confucianist thought, Confucian thought. Um, so this word is actually, the word for to listen is composed of other words, uh, that being wang, which means king, ar, which means ear, and de, which means morals or virtue. So if we go back, what do we notice about the shape of this word? Well, you have the word for king in the lower left corner surrounded by the ear. So the people listen to the king. And after they're done thinking about it or considering it, they realize that the king has virtue, the king has morals. And this is kind of the, the foundation or the core idea of Confucianism, that order is most important and that order is achieved by embracing hierarchy. This hierarchy is consensual. It is not something imposed. It is not something that people need to be free of. They are content to be a cog in a bigger machine or in a Confucian, somebody who believes in Confucianism is content to be a cog in a bigger machine and they are very eager to do their job very well. Uh, so just as children obey their parents, commoners obey the emperor. And just as parents are obliged to provide for their children, so too is the government obliged to provide for the people. So this is not a blind obedience. The expectation is that you will be a good pa parent to your kids and the government will be a good parent to the people. Um, and so 
the people are the the government in this kind of society can get away with a lot more than say for example in a liberty or rights based society that we have in the west there is also a very great emphasis on literally making sure that people have enough food to eat um, and this is actually reflected in another uh, linguistic t uh, tidbit. Um, the word for breakfast is zaofan, and the word for to rebel or to uh, revolt is zaofan, which is almost a homonym, uh, except for the tone difference. And the word for food is literally half, like literally half of that word, uh, the second word in the word for breakfast, right? That second character, half of it is the word for to oppose. And so the idea that the government needs to provide for the material well-being of the people is a really important idea. And if the government does not provide for the material well-being of the people, then the people believe that that is a sign that they now have the tacit consent of heaven to rebel against the emperor. This is a very old idea, and it's very entrenched in the Chinese mindset. And if you ask any Chinese politician, any Chinese uh, intellectual, or, or anybody that is uh, that cares a lot about politics over there, what is the number one job of government? They'll say it's to make sure that everybody has a full belly. And so the reason why this kind of came uh, this kind of came about is because when Mencius and Confucius were writing during the Warring States period, um, most kings did not think about it this way. They did not think about ruling this way. They thought that the b biggest, most important thing a king can do is to take over all of their neighbors. So they thought their main responsibility was to make war and to conquer all of China and expand the amount of land that under their control. But as a result, very often farmers were not able to reap the harvest. And since the, the harvest wasn't able to be collected, many people died of starvation. And, um, you know, Confucius and Mencius rail against this kind of behavior all the time. And they say that, no, the, the important thing is not to be fighting war, but to be making sure that everybody is home, that they can do all the planting, that they can take care of their crops and have a bumper harvest. That's their main goal. And they are content, as I, this is in my own words, the goal of the, the ideal Confucian ruler is not to outright defeat their enemies, but to outshine them. They want to have such a well-run country that all the, in, brightest, smartest, richest people from everywhere in the world want to come to your country and become citizens of your country. Um, and according to uh, Jeremy Paul Thiel, who wrote a paper about uh, Mencius and world order theory, um, this means that policymakers seek to escape a vicious cycle of competition where it's, you know, a zero-sum game and instead pursue a virtuous cycle of cooperation where people are not actively trying to compete against each other, but are rather actively trying to compete against themselves of yesterday and to continue perfecting themselves. And so one way in which, a really major way in which this sort of Confucian ideal manifests in modern Chinese foreign policy is the five principles of peaceful coexistence, which were laid out by Zhou Enlai in 1954 in response to disputes between India and China and the border between the two. And so uh, you can see the five principles here. And what you will notice is that there is a very strong emphasis on sovereignty. Uh, and so they do not, in the words of Chinese, they do not want to interfere in the internal governance of other countries, nor do they want to have other countries interfere in their internal matters or their internal politics. And that comes up all the time when you see people, when you see, um, you know, diplomats 
addressing issues like Taiwan or uh, Tibet and the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. They say that this is an internal issue and has nothing to do with you. We don't comment on how you treat your minorities. We don't comment on you know your territorial claims. So why are you bothering to get involved in our business? That's kind of the way that they look at it. But this kind of reflects this idea that they are content to mind their own business and to make sure that their own people succeed and that they uh, can get rich and that they can you know, achieve their goals and effectively outshine their competition uh, rather than outright defeat them. And actually, um, in, you know, ever since the Communist Party has come to power, um, there has been two major wars that they were involved in. There was the intervention in Korea, and there was the small-scale invasion of Vietnam. However, um, China's involvement in Korea came before the adoption of Zhou Enlai's Five Principles. So the only war that China was involved in since then was their punitive war against Vietnam, which China justified saying that, well, you know, the Vietnamese are going into Cambodia and they're being the bully. So from their point of view, it was, um, in the words of Deng Xiaoping, like giving uh, a child a spanking. That's literally how he put it. Um, and besides a very, very small chunk of land, which was kind of like a symbolic uh, change of borders, there was no actual change in territory. Um, and since then, uh, as I said, things have been pretty consistent with what Zhou Enlai was talking about and this sort of Confucian ideal of being content to outshine your uh, neighbors or your competitors rather than outright defeat them. And I think that this is uh, a really important thing for understanding the Chinese mindset. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you for listening to my presentation.